Okay, welcome back one and all to Grockett's OG TV. You're watching the GMAT edition. We're going through the 12th edition to the guide to the test. Um, it has the purple cover with the big 12th edition on it. Um, it says 12th edition review. And uh, <clears throat> when we've been going through uh, a number of problems already so far. So far, we uh, have gotten through page 280. And we left off last time finishing with question number 86 on page 280. We're about halfway through the data sufficiency section, and so we're going to do another 14 problems in that section. My name's Jim Jacobson, and I'm one of the tutors on Grokit.com. So without further ado, I think we should get started. So like I said, page 280, and we are starting with question number 87. And as I tell everybody every time, because I don't know who's new to each broadcast, for the data sufficiency section, I write down what each of the answer choices stands for down the side. Um, to me, it serves as a helpful reminder of the fact that you can uh, <clears throat> symbolize what each statement stands for with a single character. Statement one, you know, one stands for one alone, two stands for statement two alone is sufficient, T stands for together, E stands for either, and N stands for neither. And when I do my own little grids on, on scrap paper, I write 1, 2, 10, 1, 2, 10, rather than A, B, C, D, E, you know, for crossing off answer choices. So anyway, a little bit of autobiographical information about me, I guess. Anyway, we shall move on then. Question number 87. Is the number of seconds required to travel d sub 1 feet at r sub 1 feet per second greater than the number of seconds required to travel d sub 2 feet at r sub 2 feet per second? So it's a rate question, and actually we had a question very like this last time, for those of you who have been tuning into the entire series of broadcasts. So um, we have two ratios, and of course the important formula here is that uh, distance equals rate times time. And for this one, we're actually comparing the two different times. So time equals distance over rate. And that's why we're given two d's and two r's. So the question is asking us, is uh, d1 over r1 greater um, than d2 over r2? I will avoid making a Star Wars r2d2 joke here probably because there isn't really a joke to be made. Anyway, so in order to know which, whether these um, respective, in order to know whether the first ratio is greater than the second ratio, we either need to know um, information about the actual numbers for these things um, or their relative relationship. Um, so let's see what the statements give us. Statement one tells us that d1 is 30 greater than d2. So if d1 is 30 greater than d2, that tells us that if we add t, d, uh, 30 to d2, we will have the same as d1. Clearly, this doesn't give us any information about the rates, the r's in this uh, inequality that we have. So this can't be sufficient on its own. It's not going to be a, and it's not going to be d. Statement two, we find out that R1 is 30 greater than R2. So R1 equals R2 plus 30. Once again, not knowing anything about the distances involved, just having the bottoms of these fractions tells us nothing about their relative value. So it's not going to be B. Now we have to consult the two statements in conjunction. <clears throat> and here the issue is, that adding numbers to elements of a ratio does not give you any information about how those ratios interrelate. So, for example, if we choose, let's say, um, D2, um, let's see, how should I do this? R2 and um, this. In case you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm setting up kind of a chart for comparing possible values. So if we say that R1 is 1, 
and uh, d2 is 2. Sure. Um, then <clears throat> d2 over r2. Did I do this right? Let's do it the other way around. Uh, let's do d2. Oh, I'll erase this. So I want to make my point extra clear. So we'll make d2 1 and r2 2. So d2 over r2 is 1 half. We add 30 to each of these, then uh, r1 becomes 32, and d or r1 becomes 32, d1 becomes 31. And d1 over r1 becomes 31 over 32. <clears throat> In comparing the two fractions, uh, would you rather have 31 30 seconds of a million dollars or only half a million dollars? Of course, I made it clear from that. 31 out of 32 is a much bigger fraction than, um, than 1 half. So with these numbers, d1 is greater than d2. If instead we decide to make, oh, let's say, um, d2 60 and r2 30, <clears throat> this gives us uh, 60 over 30, which is the same thing as 2 over 1. We add 30 to each. We have 60 and 90. We get 90 over 60. When you divide by uh, 30, it ends up being 3 over 2. So in this particular case, 2, 2 over 1, is greater than 3 halves, which is just 1 and a half. So if we, choosing different numbers d2 over r2 ends up being the greater fraction. So just adding numbers to elements in the ratio completely changes the ratio. And, it, it, without, and if you don't know what the numbers are that go into creating that ratio, it's in no way going to be sufficient. So it's not c, it is e. Last year, if Arturo spent a total of $12,000 on his mortgage payments, real estate taxes, and home insurance, how much did he spend on his real estate taxes? So we know that just from the original problem, so we'll call M his mortgage payments, we'll just use the first letter, R his real estate taxes, and H his home insurance, those three things together equal 12000 and we want to know what r equals. Obviously, three variables in one equation is not going to be enough. Let's see what the statements give us. Last year, oh, this is statement one. Last year, the total amount that Arturo spent on his real estate taxes and home insurance was 33 and one third percent of the amount that he spent on his mortgage payments. So the amount that he spent on his real estate taxes and his home insurance, R plus H, was one-third. 33 and one-third percent is the same thing as one-third. That equaled one-third of his mortgage payments. So while this statement does um, give us an additional uh, value or an additional equation, we need basically three distinct equations to solve for three distinct variables normally. Um, <clears throat> Or if we're able to solve for, um, well, let me just rewrite the equation here. M plus, no, no, I can leave it that way. M plus R plus, don't do that, come on, plus R plus H equals 12,000. What this gives us, R plus H gives us this. So we could solve for m very easily by knowing that r plus h equals one third of m. Uh, everything is in terms of m, so, but solving for m still doesn't allow us to isolate what part of one third of m is r and what part of it is h. So that's why it's insufficient. So it's not a and it's not d. Statement two, last year the amount that Arturo spent on his real estate taxes was 20% of the total amount he spent on his mortgage payments and his home insurance. So um, real estate taxes were 20% of um, M plus H. 
This, on the other hand, is much more helpful. Rewriting the original equation so that m plus h are next to each other, um, r plus m plus h equals 12,000. Here, we are given m plus h. Knowing that this equals, uh, or um, knowing that m plus h gives us this, we can multiply both sides times, <clears throat> or excuse me, divide both sides by 0 0.20 to find out that m plus h equals something in terms of r, um, and then substitute that value in for m plus h. All of it's in terms of r. We have a single variable with one equation, and we can solve for r. We're not going to do that because, of course, on the real GMAT, it's not in our best interest to do too much solving, but it is clear that we are able to substitute this value into our original equation and solve. So statement two is sufficient. So it's answer choice B, not C or E. To 80, number 89. Is the number of members of club X greater than the number of members of club Y? And I'm going to, well, no, actually we don't know anything else. Um, so let's take a look at the statements. So I guess the question we're, we're asking is X greater than Y? Let's take a look at the statements. Statement one says, of the members of club X, 20% are also members of club Y. So it sounds like we have um, one of these overlapping sets questions. With the credit card logo. So um, we want to know whether X is greater than Y. Let's pretend that's a capital X. Um, so the way that we could determine this um, is that both of them share you may remember the formula for um, overlapping sets is um, whatever's in the first one plus whatever's in the second one minus those that are in both because they both share that plus those that are in neither equals the total. We don't actually have to use the formula here, but just refreshing your memory that this is aligned with this. So they share the amount that's in both. So the number that's in X and the number that's in Y is really... Um, Oh, I don't know. Let's just call this x instead, and we'll call this y instead. So the question is ultimately asking, is x plus both, this is a little x, greater than y plus both? And since they have that amount that, that uh, is in the middle in common, it's still asking, is x greater than y? But is the x alone, the amount that's only in x and not in y, greater than the amount that's in Y alone. I'll make this a capital Y, capital X. If the small amounts, the amounts within the circle here, minus the both, if the red is greater than the green, then the whole circles, the big X and the big Y, are also, uh, they have the same relationship because they share this amount here. Okay, so statement one tells us that the of the members of club X, 20% are also in club Y. So um, statement one tells us that one fifth of um, of the big X are in both, which tells us. Um, that means that four-fifths are um, in X alone, you know, the red part of, our, of the diagram. That also means that the amount that um, are in the red part of the picture is four times the amount that's in both. So um, four-fifths of X are only in X, one-fifth of X is in both, so the alone part is four times the both part. Okay, 
Of course, that still doesn't tell us anything about y, so this isn't going to be sufficient on its own. So it's not b and it's not d. Whoa, haha, <laughs> it's not a and it's not d. Sorry about that. Anyway, statement two. Of the members of club Y, 30% are also members of club X. So this gives us um, something else similar to what we just had. So, um, so 3 tenths of capital Y are in both. That's 30%. Which means um, 7 tenths are in um, the green part, y alone. And 7 tenths relationship to 3 tenths, that tells us that y alone is, um, 7 is 2 and uh, 1 third um, times, times the value of both. 2 and 1 third times 3 gives you 7. So y alone equals 2 and 1 third times both. But that alone gives us no information about x, so now we really can cross off b, and we are left with consulting the two together. So even though we don't actually have numbers for either x or y, we have both of them in terms of the number of people that they share in these two clubs. If the number in the red portion in x is four times the number in the middle, and the number in the green portion in y is two and one third times the number in the middle, well, x is clearly greater because it's um, almost twice as many people are in x as in y. So the answer is yes. In conjunction, the two are sufficient to tell us yes, that x is greater than y. Answer choice C. Number 90, 280, number 90. If k, m, and t are positive integers and k over 6 plus m over 4 equals t over 12, do t, do t, do t and 12 have a common factor greater than 1? Good question. So we have k over 6 plus m over 4 equals t over 12. 12. And uh, do t and 12 have a common factor? So let's uh, try and put this whole equation into something where they at least share a denominator. So let's put it all in terms of twelfths because uh, both 6 and 4 are factors of 12. So k over 6 becomes 2k over 12, m over 4 becomes 3m over 12, and t stays t over 12. So really what this is asking then is, or what this is saying is that 2k plus 3m equals t. So what we want to know is does t have a common factor with um, the other two. So if if um, if two k times three uh, m or two k plus three m ends up being a uh, multiple of twelve, uh, then t or a multiple of twelve greater than two or greater than one. Uh, then t and 12 do have a common factor. So, um, statement one, we find out that k is a multiple of 3. So that gives us, in this first one, 2k is going to be 2 times a multiple of 3. And remember, 12 is, uh, you know, 4 times 3, which is 2 times 2 times 3. So if we end up with more than just these factors in t, then t has um, th then t is going to be a multiple of twelve greater than one, and the answer will be yes. So so if uh, we have two times a multiple of three plus three times m, which is itself another multiple of three, 
because three times anything is going to be a multiple of three, um, then we actually do have um, enough numbers here for t itself to be a multiple of 12 greater than 1. So statement 1, sorry, that's statement 1, is sufficient. Statement 2, so we can cross off b and c and e. Statement 2, m is a multiple of 3. Now, we started off with 2k plus 3m equals t. 3m was already a multiple of 3 because it's 3 times something. Knowing that m is also a multiple of 3 doesn't really do anything for us. If k is a multiple of 3, um, because 2 multiples of 3 will also be, um, uh, and 12 is also a multiple of 3, um, then it's sufficient. If k is something like 2, then we don't actually have enough 3s uh, to have the multiple of, um, to have uh, t be a multiple of 12 greater than 1. Right, yeah. Or to, for uh, t and 12, sorry, for t and 12 to have a common factor, uh, they could even have 12 as a factor rather than just 1. So uh, in this first one, we have enough stuff for them to be, um, for it to be a, to be, for it to be at least 12. In the second one, we still, not without knowing what k is, we don't have enough to know whether it is a, at least 12, let alone a multiple thereof. So, uh, statement 2 is going to be insufficient because if k equals 2, it's insufficient. If k equals 3, just as an example, it is sufficient. And with it, when it's sometimes yes and sometimes no, uh, the answer is not sufficient. So it is answer choice A, not D. Okay, 91. In the figure above, is CD greater than BC? So, figure above looks approximately like this. A to D. E, C. Okay. Is CD greater than BC? Without knowing some numbers, we still won't know. So, statement one. Uh, AD equals 20. So that tells us that the whole length is 20. It gives us nothing about the relative positions of the points, so um, really there's no way that this could be sufficient. It's not A and it's not D. Statement 2, AB equals CD. So that tells us, actually I'll use green, that this and this are equal. But what it doesn't tell us is the relationship of this section here and this section here. So while AB and CD are equal, we don't know, even though in my picture CD is greater than BC, uh, we can't rely on that from the picture in the book. So statement two on its own really just tells us that those two are equal. So it's not B. Consulting the two together, even knowing that the whole thing is 20 and then CD and AB are equal, um, there's a number of ways that you can have these two numbers be equal and BC will have varying lengths. AB and CD could each be 1, and so they would be equal, uh, and then BC would be 18, and CD would not be greater than BC. Conversely, BC could be um, 2, for example, and CD and AB could be 9 each. So. Um, there's more than one way, and then in that case, CD would clearly be greater than BC. So since it's sometimes yes, sometimes no, even with the two in conjunction, insufficient. Answer choice, E. Number 92. In a certain office, 50% of the employees are college graduates and 60% of the employees are over 40 years old. 
If 30% of those, oh, those over 40 have master's degrees, how many of the employees over 40 have master's degrees? So we want to know those who are over 40 and um, with an MA or MS master's degree, or I suppose an MBA. Okay, which is what all of you who are watching this are trying to get. I shouldn't have uh, dismissed it anyway, or forgotten it actually, I didn't dismiss it. Anyway, so moving on, in order to know that number, all we have are percents in the original question, and so to know the actual value, we need a single number. We need to know how many people are in the office. Statement one, exactly 100 of the employees are college graduates. So 100 are college grads. But from the original question, we find out that 50% of the employees are college grads, which means we have 200 total employees. And if we have 200 total employees, we can figure out the other percentages in the question. So if 60% um, of the employees are over 40 years old, 60% of 100 would be 60, so 60% 60 of 200 is 120, so we have 120 people who are over 40. And then we find out from the problem, if 30% of those over 40 have master's degrees, how many have master's degrees? Well, we could stop there knowing we can figure out what 30% of 120 is. Uh, of course, 10% is 12, so 3 times that is 36. I know we're not supposed to figure, but that was an easy, that was an easy step. So statement one actually is sufficient to tell us. So it's not going to be B, C, or E. Statement two tells us that of the employees 40 years old or less, 25% have master's degrees. So there's no number. We need the number of people in the office or just the number of people um, who are over 40. I guess this should have been 41 and older. Um, without an actual number from statement two, we have no idea how many of the of those over 40 have master's degrees. Even though it tells us that 25% uh, under have uh, the master's degrees, it's not enough. So statement two is insufficient, leaving us with answer choice A. We need real numbers when we have percents on a value question. Two eighty. Last one on page two eighty is number ninety three. So on the number line above, P, Q, R, S, and T are five consecutive even integers in increasing order. What is the average arithmetic mean of these five integers? So. So the, uh, the official guide takes a slightly different approach than I want to take on this one. Um, if you prefer using the average formula to solve this one, um, then by all means go ahead and take a look after the broadcast or pause the broadcast if you're watching it after the, after the fact. Uh, go ahead and read their description. Um, I'm taking what I consider to be a shortcut. A good thing to remember about consecutive numbers and integers is that when you have an odd number of consecutive numbers, the average is the middle one. That's how simple it is, because for every number, so, you know, if you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or, you know, 334, 335, 336, 337, and 338, it doesn't really matter what the numbers are. Uh, the middle number is the average. For every one you go up, you go down one, and that keeps the average the same. Same thing here. The average is going to be 336 without even having to add them up and divide by 5. So with five integers, and this is true even when it's consecutive even or consecutive odd integers. So if you had, you know, two, four, six, three, even, three consecutive even integers, um, two plus four plus six is 12, divided by three is four. So the average is the middle one. So really, this question is asking us, what is R? And that's, that's all there is to it. We also know that they're positive since it is a number line and they are in ascending order.
Oh, I suppose it, it actually could be uh, negative integers. I'm sorry. For, scratch what I just said. Uh, and the, we could be approaching 0 to the right. It doesn't matter. Statement 1 tells us that q plus s equals 24. So you'll note from the picture that q and s are the numbers on either side of r. And since these are consecutive even integers, they are the even numbers on either side of r. If you have three even numbers, the average of those numbers um, is going to be the average of q and r, 6 plus 2, um, is 8 divided by 2 is 4. The average of the two numbers on either side of the number is going to give you the average or the middle number. So q plus s equals 24. The average of q and s q plus s divided by 2 equals 12. And that's r. r equals 12. So statement 1 is sufficient. We can cross off uh, b alone as well as c and e. Statement 2, the average arith er or, er er or arithmetic mean of q and r is 11. So um, the average of q and r is 11. All that's telling us, and again, remember, these are consecutive even integers. That's saying that the odd number between q and r is 11. What are the even numbers on either side of 11? 10 and 12. This one's Q, this one's R. We got that from the picture. So, again, R is 12. No need to use the average formula even. So, statement 2 is also sufficient. Answer choice D. Again, there's, there's a longer formula adding them all together um, in the, ant in the uh, explanations further on in the book. So if you want a different explanation, by all means, check that out. Sometimes multiple explanations can help you understand problems differently. On to the next page, page 281, number 94. So if line k in the xy plane has the equation y equals mx plus b, where m and b are constants, what is the slope of k? And of course, y equals mx plus b is, you should have memorized as the slope-intercept form of a line, and the, the form that you most commonly put equations into when you want to compare their slopes. So um, we need the slope of line k. So um, slope of k equals what? Statement 1, k is parallel to the line with equation y equals 1 minus m, quantity 1 minus m times x plus b plus 1. So if, the, if k is parallel to this line, it means it has the exact same slope. So if we can figure out the slope of this line's equation, y equals 1 minus m x plus b plus 1. And we know b is a constant, so really this is the y equals mx plus b. And here, um, we can just treat this quantity here, 1 minus m, as the slope. So this is the same thing as y equals um, m x plus b, where these two things feed into b, and these two things feed into the slope. Which means, then, that the slope of this line, m, is equal to 1 minus m. So we add m to both sides, we get 2m equals 1, and m equals 1 half. And that's all we need to know. That's the slope. So statement one is sufficient. It's not going to be statement two on its own, uh, nor is it going to be either of those ones where statement one is insufficient. The second answer choice, or second statement, k intersects with the line, uh, intersects the line with equation, sorry, <laughs> k intersects the line with equation y equals 2x plus 3 at the point 2, 7. Now, um, I don't know if you remember stuff about the xy plane, but basically, unless two lines are parallel, like this, and the definition of parallel means that they are the same distance from each other forever, they never meet, and they never sp spread any further. 
unless two lines are parallel, completely parallel for all eternity in every direction, they cross somewhere. So the fact that line k intersects with some other line is completely unremarkable. It has a chance in one in infinity of not intersecting. There's only one way the two lines can be parallel. Um, well, sorry, they can be parallel infinite number of ways. You know, it could be parallel out here or parallel down here. But every other line with every other slope in all history of numberdom is going to intersect with the line somewhere. So just knowing where it intersects and knowing the slope of that line is completely meaningless and insufficient. If it told us that it was perpendicular to that line, then we could do something. But just knowing that it intersects tells us nothing. So statement two is insufficient. It is answer choice A. Statement one alone was enough. So 281, number 95. Is RST equal to 1? I don't know. Let's find out. Statement 1, RS equals 1. So uh, this gives us information for R and S, but um, it's definitely not sufficient. You know, R could be um, 2 and s could be one half, and those would equal one, um, or um, they each could be one. But we don't have any information about t, so we have no idea whether rst is going to equal one. It's not a, and it's not d. Statement two, same thing. We have s times t equals one, and again, without knowing what r is, it's going to be insufficient. We need to know the product of all three, so it's not statement two on its own. In conjunction, we know that rs equals 1 and st equals 1, which means that rs equals st, and that definitely means that r equals t, but the question is, does s equal r and t? For example, if all three of them are 1, then rst does equal 1, but if, um, oh, for example, um, if r equals to, uh, not r squared, if r equals to and uh, t equals to and s equals one half, r times s equals one, t times s equals one, but r times s times t equals two. So depending on what values we choose for r, s, and t, it depends on whether it equals one. So since the answer is it depends, the two statements are insufficient. So even in conjunction, the two are not enough. This is as opposed to R, S, T, it's a T. Huh. If all of them equal 1, then yes. If they equal this, then no. So two eighty one number ninety six. The figure above represents a circle graph of company H's total expenses broken down by the expenses for each of its five divisions. If O is the center of the circle, and if company H's total expenses are $5,400,000, what are the expenses for division R? And this is just you know going to be approximate, because it's not that important whether my picture exactly meshes with theirs. And then this here is x. And the total is 5,400,000 dollars. So in order to have sufficiency, we basically need to know what x is, uh, because x is a fraction of the circle. It's a sector of the circle. Um, it will have the same whatever fraction it is of 360. r will be that fraction of 5,400,000. Let's see what we get. Statement 1, x equals 94. Wow. Well, that's about as explicit a sufficient answer as we can get. That means that 94 degrees for the piece of pi that r represents, 94's fraction of the 360 degrees in the circle will equal division r's um, expenses out of the total of 5,400,000. 
and we don't actually have to do the math, we just need to know that we could, and with one variable and a straight up algebraic equation like that, that's totally going to be sufficient. So it's not statement two on its own, um, and it's not, oh sorry, it's not C or E where one end, where one is insufficient. Could still be D. Statement two, the total expense uh, total expenses for division S and T are twice as much as the expenses for division R. So S plus T equals 2R, which is an equation, which is nice, uh, but without values for S or T, um, or knowing what fraction of the entire circle S and T are, uh, it's not going to be enough. We would actually need some numbers or um, angle measures for us to figure out what R is from this, so this is insufficient. So I can go back to crossing off D, and it is answer choice A. Statement one alone is sufficient. So 281, number 97. If x is negative, is x less than negative 3? We have to remember that x is negative. Because they told us to. Okay, so, uh, statement 1. Not much we can do beyond that. Statement 1 tells us that x squared is greater than 9. Um, so remember when we, you know, in the, on the GMAT, if you get x squared equals 9, you would have x is equal to 3 or negative 3. Because uh, taking the square root of a number raised to the second power, you have to account for negative factors. Negative 3 times negative 3 is 9 just as 3 times 3. So if x squared is greater than 9, um, then we know that basically the absolute value of x is greater than 3, which means that uh, x is either greater than 3 or less than negative 3, but remember x has to be negative, so we end up with x being less than negative 3. So statement 1 is sufficient to tell us yes, x is less than negative 3. It's not going to be statement 2 on its own, nor will it be c or e. Statement 2 tells us that x cubed is less than negative 9. So um, this one's a little bit trickier um, because you can pick numbers, and in fact picking numbers might be the easiest way to do this. Let's just say that x is negative 3. x cubed, negative 3 times negative 3 is 9, times 3 is negative 27. So x cubed is negative 27, which is less than negative 9, but the answer is no, x is not less than negative 3. We could just as easily uh, choose negative 4. So if x equals negative 4, uh, x cubed, you know, 4 times 4 is 16, times 4 um, is 64, so negative 64. So here, where x is less than negative 3, it's still x cubed is less than negative 9. So the answer is sometimes no and sometimes yes. That is not sufficient. So that leaves us only answer choice A as sufficient. Okay, 281. Number 98. Seven different numbers are selected from the integers 1 to 100, and each number is divided by 7. What is the sum of the remainders? Wow. Uh, seven different numbers from the number 1 to 100. Okay. So, um, Right, well, um, basically we need to know a little bit more about these numbers. There's, there's a sum of the sum of the remainders, um, 
seven numbers, one to 100, and they are divided by seven. Crazy, huh? Okay. Statement one tells us the range of the seven numbers is six. The range, of course, is the difference between the largest number and the smallest number. Oh, the range of the seven remainders. Maybe I didn't say that. So um, we could choose six multiples of seven. So if the numbers are, you know, seven, 14, 21, um, uh, 28, I'm losing track, uh, one, two, three, four, 35, 49, um, and one, two, three, four, five, six. We could make one of them um, 13. Ah, my pointer has disappeared. This is no good. Whoa, I don't want to have to draw with the mouse. This is going to be terrible. Um, I'll try. It's going to take me a little bit longer. Oh, sorry. I don't want. I don't want six there. I want thirteen. Okay, so that's supposed to be a thirteen. Wow. Well, I apologize for the technical difficulties. My pen has just stopped working, and there's a new battery in it. Let me just see if I can replace move the battery around a little bit. So I really don't want to write with the uh, mouse pad. Okay, wow, it definitely appears to be dead. That's no good. Okay, this will be different. So um, if one of the numbers is 13, it will have the remainder of 6 which will give the range of the numbers 6, and the sum will be 6. If we choose a whole bunch of different numbers, one which is you know a multiple of 7, giving the bottom range 0, and, the, um, and then every, a bunch of different numbers, at least one of which gives us the top range of numbers, the top range of 6, or the top value of 6, and it doesn't matter what the other five numbers are here, um, then um, it still has the range of six, but the sum of the remainders will be very different. So statement one is going to be insufficient because it depends what numbers we pick for our, for our numbering. So it's not statement one on its own, and it's not going to be uh, either one sufficient on its own. So statement two, this is so upsetting. I wonder if I should just stop. Um, Okay, um, no, so statement two tells us the seven numbers selected are consecutive integers. So um, if they're consecutive integers and they're divisible by seven, you will never have remainder eight or remainder nine. So our only possible remainders are zero, one, two, three, Four, five. I apologize for the. Whoa! Why did it do that? Six. Okay. So we only have seven different possibilities for the remainder. If you know, uh, so if you get through the numbers up starting with seven, you have remainder zero, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and then when you get back to fourteen, it gets back to, to being um, remainder zero. So um, there are only seven remainders possible. And if the numbers are consecutive, they will, will always have the same, um, the same remainders. Now, it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the first, nu the first number will be divisible by, by seven, but we'll end up using each of these remainders once with seven consecutive integers. So no matter what numbers we pick, if they are consecutive, we will use each of these remainders once, and the sum of the remainders will always be 6 plus 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1 plus 0. So statement 2 is sufficient. We can cross off the together and the neither because 
the statement to, uh, two alone is sufficient. Let me just briefly try quitting and then restarting my pen program. Maybe that's the problem. Apparently not. Okay. Um, I think I'm just going to stop there because it's going to take me so much longer to um, write all this stuff out with the mouse pad. So we will stop there. I apologize for ending a little bit short of the questions that um, I that were published that I would go through. And we will pick up next time with, um, we will start off with question number 99 instead of number 101 and hopefully we'll catch up to where the rest of the schedule goes from there. So thanks for joining me this time, and uh, apologize for the technical difficulties at the end, and hope to see you next time. My name is Jim Jacobson, and you've been watching Crockett.com's OGTV GMAT edition.